Okay, I guess we are recording. All new. Yep, it's recording. Oh, you know all these things. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at that. So, uh, so just just uh, for people, and I'll go back here for a second. Just uh, so you know what's going on, um, we've been at the Marine Center on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and uh, getting ready for our first spawn of oysters, which will be the day after Valentine's Day. We wanted to have it on Valentine's Day, but Valentine's Day is a Sunday, so that's that doesn't work. So. We're gonna do our first spawn on, on the 15th, I believe of, of February. And then we'll be uh, raising our larvae and, and uh, getting all the systems up and running and uh, looking forward to an early spring. Um, I'm told that the, the groundhog is getting his vaccination and we'll be looking to see <laughs> if he's allowed to come and see his shadow. Uh, but <laughs> Uh, I don't know if anyone else has been having any luck with vaccinating or any of those things, but you know, once you I feel, did, I did. Oh, good. Well, once you feel safe that you want to, you know, come by the Marine Center, people have been coming in, we're masked up and we, we do distance, uh, but you know, we are operating. Um, and, you know, we're hoping for a, a, a regular good season. So, uh, We'll be doing these. Let me ask you a question. Um, is this time of day at or day a good time for these lectures? Fridays at five or is there better days? People can email me. I, I think I'll have Darcy send out a, a, a kind of a general email to see uh, what days people are picking up. Uh, because I can do it, you know, obviously I can do this anytime. Uh, doesn't really matter to me when I do it. Okay. So, How are you? I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe. There's Darcy. You know. <laughs> Hi, Darcy. I'll, I'll... Hey. Oh, there's Josh. Hi, Kim. Everybody, yeah. we're, they, they were also having a, uh, a happy, a, 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 a Marine Center happy hour. So I can see all the people from the Marine program that, that are bored with that already and are doing the That's why I said 5.30. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll send out a, uh, a couple emails will be going out. One, I, I recorded a, uh, since I'm doing these things now and getting more in, uh, sad, okay. let's say, I did record a shucking video, which um, is going to be available teaching people how to shuck oysters. And we'll do okay. these full lecture series. It is being recorded, so they will be able to be watched, I, I suppose, <laughs> anybody wants to watch them. But if you want to be a part of it, we'll figure out the best day. Right now, it's going to be the third Friday of every month at five o'clock, unless people say, uh, you don't care. Already, I, Mike Slade already said it's good. So if Mike Slade going. said it's good, then. <laughs> Okay, so let's dig in. So the first, um, also to let you know, uh, Josh Perry is sitting sitting as one of the participants here, and he's he's the Marine Center uh, resident algae guru, and mm -hmm. uh, well, I would say micro algae guru. Uh, maybe Steve Schott, who is in this presentation coming up, uh, it might be our macro algae guru. I don't know, uh, but. When it comes to growing microalgae, which we'll talk about briefly uh, in this uh, lecture, uh, Josh is going to do the second half of much more intense how we grow algae to feed uh, our, our animals in the, in the hatchery. So this, this uh, talk today will be mostly on macroalgaes and other things other than growing the cultured microalgae that we use for our shellfish. And then Josh will uh, be giving a, a, a follow up in the next week or so. And so we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, we do have our spat hatch, uh, spat algae room working. And so if people want to get more involved in this algae culture, uh, you can talk to Charlie Peck or just come on down. So let's go through this. The, the first order of business is what is algae? And 
algae is a really interesting thing because it is a uh, what we would call a phytoplankton, which is a a plant plankton. Plankton being Latin for wanderer, meaning that plankton just kind of drifts around. It it, uh, it it doesn't have a, a, a means of direction, but it does have a means of motility, which is kind of interesting. And uh, yeah. what's here? Okay, so I, I should have premised this talk or prefaced this talk with the fact that we're here yeah. for a specific reason, and the reason is to get one-liners for cocktail parties, okay? That, that, that's the like that's the ultimate goal of these lectures is to grab little one-liners that you can use when you're in the supermarket or at a cocktail party mm -hmm. or trying to basically wow your neighbor into thinking that you're, you know, more intelligent than they are, which you probably are anyway. So, one of the, here here's the first one. Uh, hey, Chris. So here's here's the first one. And this is really a, quite an intriguing uh, piece of information that a lot of people don't know. Okay. How many plants plants are there in the world's oceans? And you see ponder, go ahead. We each will go through and you ponder that thought of how many plants are in the world's oceans. And you might immediately say, well, you know, millions. And the answer is that there's less than a hundred in the world's ocean that have been keyed out. Uh, we only have one plant in our water. And actually there's only one plant from Delaware to Newfoundland. And that's eelgrass. It's our only plant is eelgrass. Everything yeah. else that you know of in the, in the oceans that you think is a plant is in the kingdom protist. They're protists. So they're not in the plant kingdom. All phytoplankters, microalgae, macroalgae, all of these are, are protists. And what's interesting about a, a protist as opposed to a plant, eelgrass is a true plant. It pollinates, it, it has roots, uh, and so that's more like an angiosperm, a land plant. And all the marine, uh, they don't have a root system. They don't pollinate. A lot of them bud and clone, and they have what's called holdfasts. And some of them, like the microalgae, which, again, we'll get into later and Josh will get into, are they look like little tiny, uh, almost... Uh, uh, protozoans that are dashing around the, the, the microscope. They're very motile. It's, so they had to put algae into a different kingdom because it's like if your rubber plant got up and walked out of the room, you'd have to, you'd have to think about that, that it maybe wasn't just a plant. Uh, so they're protists. And again, there's <laughs> unicellular and macro. You're, you're all thinking about your rubber. You're all looking at your plants to see, make sure they're not, <laughs> not leaving. Okay. Uh, so we have unicellular microalgae, which is very important to us. I, I, I don't even know if we were talking about algae, if it wasn't the fact that unicellular microalgae is phenomenally important to our operation. Uh, and the macroalgae, uh, we should know about anyway, because they get all over your culture gear and, and they get all over your beach. And, and sometimes you, they get all over your plate if you're in the, in the sushi restaurant. So we'll, we'll look at them. Uh, but they, the, the unicellular microalgae is really the base of the marine food chain. Uh, everything wants to eat these little little phytoplankters. What's interesting about that is, I'm sure a lot of folks have gone to the coral reefs. Uh, and if you've ever been in the coral reefs and you're snorkeling or scuba diving, the water is so clear. It is, I, I've been in, uh, I was in St. Kitts at 110 feet looking up at the bottom of the boat very clearly. Now, how could you have such great visibility when you're here in New England area in New York 
uh, you're lucky if you have 10 feet visibility. And a lot of the reason why we don't have that visibility is because there's so much microalgae in the water. And which is good. Uh, I remember when I started working at Cornell it was during a brown tide year and you couldn't see your hand in front of your, your face underwater. There was so much brown tide algae. Uh, in the coral reef, the base of the food chain is a, is a different protist. It's, it's a protist called zooxanthellae that lives within corals and things like that. And so the, the microalgaes aren't really the base of the food chain down in the, in the coral reefs. It's more of this other protist. And there's now, when we said how many plants are there in the world's oceans, uh, there are multitudes and multitudes of species of protists in the world's oceans. I don't know if we've come close to keying them all out. So th that there are a lot of them there. Oh, we have 33 part participants. Hey, everybody. I don't see all 33 of you, but uh, that's probably mm -hmm. a good thing. <laughs> and oh, by the way, feel free to at any part, if you have a question, just unmute yourself and, and go ahead and dive right in. We're, we're, we're being interactive about this. So algae is usually described uh, by colors. So they're grouped by colors, red algaes, brown algaes, uh, green algaes, and blue-green algaes. Blue-green algaes are really uh, some of the oldest life form um, on our planet, blue-green algaes. And sometimes you hear about blue-green algaes being these harmful algaes in ponds and things, but there are all kinds of different species of, of, of all of these algae. So some blue-green algaes, like spirulina, you can eat that and it's supposed to be, uh, will allow you to be uh, immortal. Uh -oh. Hey, Kim. Yeah. Do you need a phone? Somebody's repairing. Somebody's repeating. Hey, Steve. I met you on MLK Day a couple yes. weeks ago. Um, and, and my wife and I toured the facility and just kind of to set the stage because I got to see your big green tubes of algae and so on, which is very impressive. Yeah. Uh, I had invited a couple people to join the call today about the SPAT program and where we're going. And I know I, I shared with somebody the other day, I said, we're going to be inseminating oysters soon. Um, well, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. Well, personally, you did get the tour, didn't you? <laughs> well, it was a, quite an intimate yes, tour. Yes, honey. It was two hours. But the, the question was, could you maybe just back up just a tad, just set the stage for us? Because I'm super excited about growing my oysters and doing all that stuff. But some people don't know what the SPAT program even is. And I, I joined a couple minutes early, but I don't think we said that yet. Oh, well, uh, you know, we can, we can come back on the SPAT program, but I will say that uh, part of the SPAT program, which uh, when you join it, are these uh, kind of informational lecture series. But in order to grow oysters, you don't have to grow, learn how to grow algae per se. It's not like you're gonna set up your kitchen to be growing algae in order for you to be culturing your oysters. So, you know, in, in general, the SPAT program is just uh, always available to, to members throughout the year for all kinds of things. And basically, don't ever worry that you're not, if you wanna get information and you wanna come down to the Marine Center, you're gonna learn things. But there's no hard and fast rule about a timing about how to do it or what exactly you have to know. Um, we take care of all of that. So it, it, it's kind of open ended uh, in one respect and it's very intensive in other respects if you want it to be. So our algae room is run entirely by SPAT members. There are no paid staff that are running the algae room. So if you want to get involved in that, you can't. And uh, you know uh, we we keep a normal Monday, Wednesday, Friday, eight to twelve hours where we're getting involved. And COVID threw everything into a little bit of a tailspin because we have to be careful how many you know we can't have a hundred people on property all breathing on each other. Well, we could, but uh, 
after the vaccines, I suppose. So, uh, you know, don't worry too much if, if, if you have people that are involved in, in coming into the uh, lecture series, there's plenty of time for us to go through, you know, the actual spat thing. And maybe I'll do a, uh, you know, that's a good point. Maybe I'll do a uh, uh, intro to spat uh, Zoom in a, in a week or so. For, and we'll send an email out. The most important thing is for new members is to somehow get me your email so we can put you on an email list to, to get the information out. Okay? So, Thank you. No what's worries. Your, what's your email address? Uh, it's KWT, the number four at Wait, KW, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, KW? T, as in Thomas. T, the, okay. The number four at cornell.edu. And, and, and let's not take up too much more of it. I mean, I could keep you here for three hours. I don't really care. I already ate. Sorry, sorry. I, I'm no, 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 it's no worries. But all of this information is available. We do have a website. I'll, 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 I, I, we can post that uh, if, if Darcy wants to chat uh, the, uh, our Cornell website out to everybody. She could do that. If she's still here, she might have gone to the social. Okay. So anyway, getting back to algae. Uh, there are all kinds of different types that we can learn about. And in the microalgaes, we have chlorophytes, flagellates, diatoms. I'm going to let Josh talk about that it, when he does his talk about these algae. So what we really want to get into is, you know, some of these concepts of algae, uh, good algae blooms. What's a good algae bloom? And how do you know it's a good algae bloom? There's one great way of telling your oysters are growing like crazy. Then you're in a good algae bloom. Okay, you can also see it, you know, here we are in the, in, in really the cold part of the winter now. And if you were to go out uh, foolishly to go swimming, right, right now, you'd notice the water's pretty clear. So it might look really good. Why is it so clear? Well, there's not a whole lot of algae out there. Uh, there might be some algae, there might be a cold water species. Uh, Ketoceros is very cold water tolerant. There might be some algae in the water right now, uh, but it's not blooming. And so once the spring comes up, you're gonna start seeing your water getting darker, richer and, and colored, like hopefully uh, a greenish to brownish without being coffee brown tinge to it. So that would be a good ar uh, algae bloom. We have to be very cognizant of harmful algal blooms. Harmful algal blooms are algae species at naturally occurring that can come up uh, that can be detrimental to different things. So for instance, brown tide was an algae that came up in, in the uh, 80s I remember, I remember coming out to Kutchog for the first time in 1984, and I came in with a sailboat into into uh, into Broadwater Cove, and it was just such a beautiful place, Kutchog in the water. But the water, I remember clamming and and looking down at the water and saying, "God, this place is beautiful," but the water looks like mocha. What's that all about? And that was the first year of brown tide. And I'll never forget that because I was clamming and, and the, the water would be turbulent with things swimming up to the surface. And those were scallops in 1984. And the next year you couldn't find a scallop in the Peconic Bay because of brown tide. That was a harmful algal bloom. And they had never really documented or heard of Oreococcus angiofrigeferens, the brown tide before that. It had just been invented. So uh, that was a harmful algal bloom. And there are other harmful algal blooms. A lot of times you can hear about a, uh, a red tide. And a red tide is harmful, not so much to shellfish, depending on what the algae species is. Uh, but if you, and so the shellfish can eat it, uh, but if you eat the shellfish that's been eating certain red algae blooms, you can get very sick. So that's a harmful algal bloom. We'll talk a little bit more about them. Fouling blooms, uh, if you're a waterfront homeowner and all of a sudden your dock and your beach and, and, and everything is covered in 
sea lettuce every year or other things, that, that would be considered a fouling bloom. And no bloom is like what's happening right now. No, nothing in the water. Now, I'm gonna give you a warning, especially for new SPAT members. If you come to the Marine Center in August and, we're, and, I'm, and you find me down at the floating upweller and you come up to me and you say, isn't the water beautiful? It's so clear. Uh, I might attempt to grab you by the, by the neck and throw you in the water because I know it's clear. There's no algae there. OK, this happens routinely that in the in the heat of the summer, you lose your microalgae blooms and the macroalgae's come in. And how do I know that? Two reasons. The water looks really clear and the shellfish isn't growing like it was. So that's a no bloom. And j just when you come in, you say, isn't it awful? The water's so clear. And I'll say, yeah, you're paying attention. Okay. Harmful algal blooms on the march. So we talked a little bit about red tide. Now, red tides, there are lots of different red algae species and, and they're pretty uh, e extremely tracked by the regulatory agents because a lot of these red tide species of microalgae can have a, a neurotoxin in them. And so, you know, if you ever read the, in the paper, uh, shellfish bed closed in blah, 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 due to uh, bio, uh, how do they put it, like biotoxin warnings. It sounds like a, a, a nuclear truck just fell off the bridge, but what, they, they never really just say, well, this is a naturally occurring red algae that's blooming up. So the, the creeks are closed until further notice. The shellfish are taking in this, these, uh, uh, these algaes, uh, uh, Alexandrium is an example of a, of a, of a uh, genus of red algae that has a neurotoxin and the shellfish eat it and eat it. And shellfish, by the way, as you might have heard, are tremendous filters and they, they filter in a lot, a lot of water and they're taking these, these everything in and incorporating them in different ways. So with algaes, they're really kind of bio, they're, they're bio concentrating them in their gut. They're making really paste of algae. So if, if you eat an oyster that's been eating red tide, you can get a pretty serious dose of this neurotoxin because it's bioaccumulated in its gut. The good news is when red tides come up, they're very well tracked and you know, people don't really get sick from eating shellfish that's been in red tide because there's no harvest allowed in, in areas where there's red tide. And these things are routine. I mean, Wellfleet Cape Cod gets a red tide every year. Uh, a lot of places get red tides every year. Uh, we're pretty lucky that we don't get like massive red tides. That, and what happens is they will dissipate and then the shellfish will clear themselves out and then they're perfectly safe to eat. I remember going into Wellfleet, they had a red tide warning and I had to have a house up in Cape Cod. And so I was visiting and I went into the fish market and they were selling oysters. And, and, I, and, and I said to the guy, I thought, I thought you had a red tide closure. And, and he said, oh yeah, that, they opened it up last week. And you know, I wonder, who the first person is that's daring enough to eat the oyster, you know, and I guess, you know, they're used to it, but so that's red tide. We, we're, we here in the Peconic are familiar with brown tide. Brown tide is a very rare algae. It's only- Can I ask a red tide question? Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. Pomerant, yeah. by the way. Yeah, yeah, I see you. Hi there. <laughs> okay. Did you um, buy a house on the water yet? No. No. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen, but- No, I agree. Um, in Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, didn't... Oh, yeah, didn't, yeah, 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 yeah. In Alfred Hitch... I should let you finish, but yeah, yeah, go ahead, finish. Well, didn't the birds go crazy because they ate shellfish that had... Exactly. That, that's, that was the premise of why the birds went crazy in, in Hitchcock's The Birds, is that they were eating like krill or something that had been eating red tide, and they, and they basically were tripping their heads off and decided, 
well, why don't we just eat a whole bunch of humans and see how that works out? <laughs> you know, so that's pretty cool. Yes, and you know, that that is, I, I've heard that too. And, and so, uh, you know, that is another very interesting thing about Red Tides that I guess besides Hitchcock, I've never thought about. What about other animals that have been eating critters that have been eating red tide? How do they react? Do they die? Do they get loopy? Uh, I mean, you can imagine a, a grizzly bear eating salmon that's been eating red tide and just, it's, you know, basically starts tearing everything apart. That would be bad. It would be almost like a land jaws kind of thing going on. <laughs> and then so. I have one question about what you said earlier about eelgrass being the only plant. Yeah. So like, like what is Spartina and all the like- Those, are, those, are, those are not uh, submerged plants. Oh, so submerged. They, those, are, those are upland, those are actual land plants. So okay. the thought was that eelgrass was also a land plant that marched back into the sea. Uh, mm. which is possible. Uh, but basically, it's the only one in our waters that is a submerged aquatic plant. I see, I see. And so when you see it washed up on the beaches, if you look at it closely, it's got root structures and you can actually root it. Um, yeah, so that was that. Uh, cool. By the way, you know, as you get down to Florida, you might have five plants and those are the ones that the dugongs are eating, all the See, and the manatees are, are eating uh, that, those, those grasses that are pretty plentiful down there. Okay, so brown tide was around for a long time and it, it you know, here's, an, here's like the opposite of red tide when it comes to who it was harming. You could eat shellfish that had been eating brown tide all day long and not get sick, but the, uh, the shellfish didn't thrive on it at all. And indeed it, it cost us for many years are scallops in, in the Peconic Bay. So that's a harmful algal bloom to, to brown tide, which was by the way, extremely small and uh, extremely dense. So it would grow into the tens of millions of cells per milliliter. Prorocentrum is, a, is an algae that comes up occasionally and that's got a, a, a harmful component more to shellfish than to humans. Uh, and hopefully we won't get that. And there are lots of harmful algaes. So Pseudonitsia, um, one of our SPAT members is part of a, a, a algae keying group that, that, that takes samples and keys them out and has found Pseudonitsia in, uh, I believe in Mattituck Inlet. Uh, Gymnodinium, Ciguatera is the one that you know, if you ever go down to the Florida Keys and they say, don't eat the Barracuda because they, they have ciguatera from eating the, the, the cor nipping at the corals that have ciguatera in them. So remember that Mike Slade, when you go down scuba diving in the Florida Keys, not to eat the Barracuda, let the Barracuda eat you, you know, whatever. Uh, and Alexandrium is one that comes up in our area quite a bit because I'm tight in the background there. So there's some, you know, when you look, if you can see this, this chart here, it says toxic microalgae, and then it says species responsible for, and they're really nasty, paralytic shellfish poisoning, diuretic shellfish poisoning, neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, amnesiatic shell, shellfish. These are sound like awful things. And so, you know, you want to pay attention to those ones that, uh, that, that come up. And I don't think there's any documented illnesses that have happened in New York from, from this in, in a while. So that's good news. This is an interesting little chart for a couple of reasons. And I'm not gonna bore you with it too much other than to show you that this was a sample taken by Jay Bredemeyer in 2006. And Schmelk, it, they spelled it wrong, but it's Suffolk County Marine Environmental Learning Center. That's the Marine Center. That's, so that's us here, Jockey Creek, Town Creek, Narrow River, and a bunch of different species that they keyed out. And the only thing that, there's two things that are really interesting about this, this slide. One of them is in 2006, this species here, Cochlidinium, was, was found in numbers in these areas. Cochlidinium is what we now know as 
we call it mahogany or rust tide. It is a red tide algae. If you're a sailor, a lot of times you'll be, or, or a boater, yachter or whatever you are on the water, a lot of times you'll be out there on the water and see what looks like a cloud, a dark cloud in the water. You look up top to see what, if it's a, if it's a cloud, break, uh, you know, blocking the sun and it isn't. It's a cloud of rust tide going across the bay. This stuff is very, it, it, it moves like, a, like an oil slick. And uh, it is a red tide, but it's not, a, it's not a harmful algae to humans if you were to eat the shellfish. But it, it apparently isn't that great for shellfish. I know we've had it in our creek at the Marine Center and, and didn't have a massive die off. So it's not, it's not terminal for them, but it, if, if that cloud lingers above the shellfish for let's say a week or two, it can, have a, it can have an effect. The other thing that's really interesting about this chart is this flagellate here. Now the flagellate is usually a, a small golden brown algae. And if you look at the numbers here, 1500, uh, 1500 it's, a, it's a number, there's more than zero here. But if you look down at Jockey Creek, 62,000, what this is saying is that in, you remember when I said, don't come to me and tell me how beautifully clear the water is? Well, this is beautifully clear water here. This is, if you've ever driven over the bridge at Jockey Creek, sometimes it looks like brown tide, it's so dark. Well, here it is, and that's really good algae. This is kind of where Otto lives. So this is a great place to grow algae. If you were to know what your algae was and what your counts were, you could almost gauge what your shellfish growth is going to look like. So these are things that you, I suppose, could do. We could show you how to count algae cells if you... Algae is really quite beautiful under a microscope. So come by the algae room sometime. We'll queue up some... some they move very quickly sometimes, uh, but, you know, they're, they're quite beautiful in their different shapes and colors. Now, the macros <clears throat> you might be more familiar with. So sea lettuce is that very broad leaf, uh, very green. And it, you know, I think this is gonna, going to become more popular as something you could potentially eat. Um, it's very salty. If you're gonna use it in your garden, you better leach the salt out before you dump it on your tomato plants because you're gonna scorch it with all that. It's almost all salt. There, it's one cell layer thick, maybe a couple cell layers thick. It's pretty, pretty thin, but broad leaf. Uh, and apparently it blooms up twice a year. So you'll get a bloom and then it might go away and then you get another bloom and then it kind of goes away. Uh, and Kim, I've actually eaten sea lettuce before. It's actually awesome. <laughs> it is awesome. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really surprised that sea lettuce isn't a more popular and, and, and obtainable kind of culinary thing. And you can see how thick it grows because here's that seagull standing on it. Uh, you know, that's like 12 feet deep there, but no, I don't know. It's a cute picture of him standing on a layer of, of sea lettuce. Here's one that you're gonna see in the winter time. Slip gut is a really weird algae because it's like a it, it, it's a filamentous algae that's like laced with bacteria. It's really slimy. It gets all over everything in the wintertime in the cold and then it sloughs off uh, as the spring comes up. Uh, it's, and, and, you know, you might pick up right now, if you went to the Marine Center, I could pick up a, a net that has slip gut all over it. It looks kind of like I don't know, not really Willie Nelson. It's more, it's more amorphous than Willie Nelson kind of fouling. But you put it up on the dock and it almost immediately like almost melts, it disappears. It, it's very thin and, and, and uh, not, not, you know, tenacious. Codium is one that you've probably seen, uh, dead man's fingers, they call it. This one is, a, is actually not indigenous, but it's pretty, uh, pretty abundant. And it, uh, th in a lot of places, this seems to be the habitat that's replaced eelgrass where scallops like to set up in codium beds. 
So, and there's some, oh, and rockweeds you're gonna find in more uh, high energy systems like the sound. Rockweeds are a, a leathery kind of brown algae that has very strong hold fast that grab onto rocks so that when the tides are bashing against the shoreline, these things can handle it. They've got the little gas filled floats so that they can float up and then they can get almost, they get pretty dry in low tide, but they survive that. So rockweeds. And kelp, this one is, you know, we have kelp. Uh, there's all kinds of different kelps, but uh, we're starting to get more involved with the sugar kelp because the sugar kelp is going to be a macroalgae that will be an aquaculture product. It is an already an aquaculture product, but I, I spoke to, I'm gonna to get to a couple pictures of Steve Schott and, his, and I spoke to him about where we were at with kelp. So I'll, I'll come back on kelp in a bit, but that can be a, a nice polyculture for commercial growers, kelp. And then there's lots of filamentous species, um, grassalaria and, uh, and these different, this is a, so now here's an eelgrass bed. So this is a plant and below it, this red algae, filamentous algae is, is a protist. So this kind of a combo environment there, pretty picture. There's a picture of Peconic Bay back in the, no, it isn't. Kim? Yeah. What, what's the stuff that fouls up the oyster bags? Mostly. Well, it could be a lot of those different ones. I've seen little kelps, sugar kelps been coming in on it. Uh, you, you see grassalaria is the fil filamentous one. A lot of times you're going to see fouling on your, uh, on your gear that is some of its algae, some of it's a tunicate, the rubbery stuff. It can sometimes throw you off a little bit. What's a plant, mm. what's an animal? on your foul, uh, on your gear. Sometimes it's a sponge, you know, sometimes you'll get the, a, a red kind of uh, uh, felt feeling stuff. And that mm -hmm. could be a sponge uh, or it can be, uh, you know, they, they, it can be an algae. It, so there's all kinds of different species. And I think this year um, we can pull out some of the gear and actually make sure we key it all out. So everyone mm -hmm. knows what everything is. Uh, but I've seen, you know, multitudes of the ones that we just discussed, grassalaria, filamentous algae, uh, sometimes some codium can come in there. It, that, that's kind of rare because you should be cleaning your gear more than, mm. than to allow for a lot of macro algaes to form. So What's that some of them dark, like, that, jelly well, stuff? well, the other thing is that in the last two years at the Marine Center, we've been getting a ton of a green filamentous algae inside the cages. So people have been coming and they open up their cages and their oysters are in there. And there's just handfuls of filamentous green algae. And, you know, it's not that bad uh, for, for the oysters. It's good, it, it restricts flow. All of, all of these fowlers restrict flow. So you, you, but what I've noticed is it's turning people's oysters this wonderful green color uh, on the shell. And so, you know, I kind of like it. Uh, if it doesn't, if it doesn't smother, I mean, you can't, you got to be a little careful that it's not smothering the, the little oyster seed. So. And what's that like star shaped, Perfect. almost like a fractal jelly like stuff? That's the star tunicate. So that, oh, okay. that's, that's okay. lecture six. <laughs> Lecture six, okay, what that, like which is titled, What the Heck's Going On With My Oysters? And so <laughs> those are the little rubbery uh, star tunicates, which is a, a, it's a colonial tunicate. So if you look closely at this mat, I always think of it lo looking kind of like uh, silly putty that's been put all over mm -hmm. the thing. Do you remember silly putty? Maybe yeah. you wouldn't, because that's not your generation. I all. remember it. Oh, okay. I remember I guess they still make it. <laughs> So if you look closely at it, you'll see lots of little stars and each star is an animal. That's the tunicate. Okay. So here's a picture of intensive raft culture of, of algae. And we're go I'm going to show you what this is in a minute, but it's just such a staggering picture of what some cultures do with their embayments. I mean, notice a couple things about this. The conspicuous 
amount of aquaculture gear or the conspicuous lack of jet skis. P take your pick <laughs> because they're both true. Uh, even though you could almost walk to the next island over there, over the aquaculture gear. I mean, that's a pretty intensive uh, assemblage of, of aquaculture gear in an embayment. And so we're going to look at what that is in a minute. Uh, this is a different kind of picture of something you'd see more like in San Francisco, upland. This is an open pond of spirulina. And so that's a, that's a blue-green algae that you can grow in these open tanks and, and concentrate it down into uh, spirulina tablets, which cost a fortune and supposedly will allow you to live to like Cicely Tyson's age. So I don't know if she took it. God bless her. I love this picture. I mean, algae is really quite beautiful. So here's a whole bunch of different species of algae all lined up, including this giant giant kelp, laminaria, and all these other different algae. It's just a beautiful picture of lots of different algae. I love this picture too, because in some places, it's like, so how are we going to grow this stuff? I don't know. Let's throw this huge contraption in the water and see if it grows all over it. Oh yeah, that works. <laughs> so I don't know. Pick it up with a forklift or you know a big crane and take it out and scrape it off and sell it for something. So um, in a way, when I look at pictures like that, it makes me realize how kind of behind we are in growing macroalgae. Uh, and then you look at that picture and say, no kidding, who wants to lift up these giant things of, uh, you know, we're going to see. There's a lot of, this is something that you might see growing commercially well, it, and it does in Maine. This is um, dulse, and you might have heard of dulse. Dulse, you can see dulse products. So I love that Maine coast sea vegetable, dulse powder, and dulse granules, and dulse kelp, and dulse tablets, and all these things. Uh, has anyone ever bought any of these? Uh, I ha I remember buying that one, that this one. And, I don't know about this one. And that one, sea seasoning, dulse granules. So, you know, it is a product that's available. I, it's just, it's still pretty niche. You know, it's a niche. It's not, uh, it's not ubiquitous, but certain algaes are ubiquitous. This one right here, Conscious Crispus, Irish moss. This is what you, this is the algae that you use to, to make carrageenan. And this is in everything. I mean, everyone has eaten this algae in one form or another. Uh, beer, dog food. Well, maybe we haven't eaten that much dog food. I haven't, but uh, certainly that salami would have been high school. You know, I would have eaten a lot of that. Uh, not anymore. So in pharmaceuticals and in, in it's a it's an emulsifier. It's a thickening agent. And it comes from algae. That's that's its form uh, that it comes from. It is a naturally occurring uh, thickening agent. It's in a lot of products, and that's the only place you get it. So, and now this one. If you like sushi, you've clearly eaten this one. Uh, the nori is is a hugely important product in it, certainly in a lot of cultures and in a lot of areas. So we're going to look at this a little bit. Uh, I've, you know, there's nice little snacks and the, the sushi wrappers and all these things. And here's how nori is made. I, I thought this was fascinating because it's so, it's, it's so beautiful, the, uh, the apparatus. So here you have this kind of greenhouse with all these tanks in the, in the greenhouse. And you take these shell strings. So these are strings with shells on them. And mm -hmm. these, are, these are shells that have had attached to it the spores of the porphyra, the nori. And so these, these were out being sporulated and you, bring, you, you can sporulate them in the tanks here. You, you can add the spores to tanks, dip the shells in, 
sporulate the shells. And then you run the sporulated water. You run these little, uh, this is, to me, this looks like something out of Don Quixote. You know, you've got these little windmill actions with, with this mesh on them, like paddle wheels going through the water. They're going through the sporulated water and it, it forms these fronds on the mesh and, and with the solar, they're growing like, like a plant, going round and round and round and, and getting nice fronds all over this mesh. And then you go out and that's what's that first picture you saw of that embayment with all the stakes. You got mom and pop and they roll out those mesh with the, with, with the fronds of, of the porphyra on them. And then they wait a bunch of months, as you can tell, because now all of a sudden it's colder. And you have this, <laughs> the thing that blows me away about this picture is if we were to try to do this and we picked up the thing after four months, would it look like pure porphyra with nothing else on it. I mean, I've never seen that where we are. You pick up anything and it's got 26 different animals and plants and everything, barnacles and, and, your, and your, uh, your colonial tunicates and everything here. It's just like pure, it looks pure. It looks like pure, uh, uh, whatever that's, nori, porphyra. And, and can can you grow this in Long Island? Uh, I think you can grow a species that would be fundamentally like that. But hold on to that thought for a second because I want to show you something that that makes you wonder if you really want. To. Well, it's not that you don't want to do it. I think everyone should be messing with this stuff. But check this out because now that looks so nice and kind of kind of artisanal and, and kind of low tech and pretty cool. Well, keep in mind that it doesn't end there. Now you bring it into the factory and now you wash it down and you stamp it and you, and you filter it and you crush it. And I love this picture because I love this, this guy, he's obviously Scottish. <laughs> Love that. He's wearing like this tartan thing in, in, uh, it says, and my chat thing is hiding it, but it basically says in Japan, they make 7 billion sheets of nori. It's like making paper. You can't compete against that operation. Okay. Commercially, these guys have it down and they're, mm. they're and they're, it is like making paper, but it's, each sheet is so valuable because it's this gorgeous algae product that is super pure and, and very valuable. So Korean production of, of 60 to 100 million sheets, but the, these guys dust, and in China, I don't know if, if they're as intense as... as... Here's another, uh, so, you know, can you grow nori? Well, you could grow, probably grow something very similar to it. And, and that could be fun. I think it would be fun to be growing all kinds of different ed edible sea vegetables uh, for local markets. Here, I mean, look at the production on the shoreline. It's like every man, woman and child and payloaders and tractors picking up this species of algae that is being sold for making auger, which is, which is a, a, a product used in pharmaceuticals and for, for purifying uh, and, and all kinds of different things you use auger for. And so this is a you know, big operation, but kind of you know, low tech, uh, very, here's very low tech. I mean, a rake and, and so, oh, and some boots. I got some boots here. Here's the sugar kelp. Now this one is being grown uh, in the sound, in the Peconic we grew, uh, Steve Schott and his group has grown this in, on the, the, the long lines that we have in Orient and it grew beautifully. And they used it in, uh, uh, some of the restaurants used it. I think some of the breweries used it. They put it in their beer. This is something that's going to become more and more obtainable and popular. 
uh, I think I think this is a, a, an excellent new species on the block that can be incorporated, especially for you know commercial growers that are growing oysters or whatever. Uh, maybe even some you know fish net uh, fish trap uh, where, fish wear structures where you can hang some lines and have them have the fronds growing and and start making some of this because you know even if you don't make a ton of it, literally a ton of it, if you made some of it and had it available for local markets, I think it would be very trendy. And, and so it would demand a high price. And uh, so there's, there's a, again, a sporulated uh, tube of the, of the, of the fronds that are going to become the, the, the sugar kelp. And I talked to Steve. That's you might not be able to tell. I think that's a Steve shot there. That Steve shot. And I, I called him up yesterday or today and asked him where he was at with this sugar kelp. And he said 12 growers are growing it now on Long Island and they're helping out with all of that. And there's some, uh, he's got some test plots out. And, and he's got fronds growing in his greenhouse. So it is an active project that if you're interested in it, he would be the person to reach out to. He's at the Marine Center as well, Steve Schott. He's our resident kind of uh, wetlands and, and uh, submerged aquatic vegetation, eelgrass and, and these kind of things. So, and, and so this was an, uh, some of his experimental fronds grown on, out on Ori in Orient. Beautiful stuff, gorgeous, absolutely. A little book of sea vegetables, that's an old book. Now, I'm not gonna get into the aquaculture grade micros because I'm gonna leave that for Josh to do, but I'm gonna just mention that, you know, we grow these different species of microalgae, T. iso, which is Tahitian isochrysis galbana. That's a, a, a little brown naked flagellate. Sounds, huh, that's a weird description. Uh, <laughs> Tetraselmus are the dark green ones, the big, big green ones. And Josh will get into all of this stuff, different species. We don't really grow any local species. Uh, this, is a, this is a high lipid strain of a small brown algae that we can feed to larvae. This is experimental and, and has, has a lot of uh, firepower behind it. We're, we're very interested in this. Um, it's a little tiny high lipid strain of algae. Ketoceros is one that we, we have some species of Ketoceros in our waters. Calcitrans, I think, is a, our local one. There, we have a different, this is a diatom. And so he'll talk to you about the difference between a diatom and, and uh, this would be a flagellate. This is a chlorophyte. This is a flagellate. This is a diatom. He'll talk to you about all that stuff so that you can go into the grocery store, remember, and say, I know what a flagellate is. And they, they're going to look at you like, what the, what's your problem, lady? Just get your bologna and move down the aisle, please. Okay. <laughs> this is a chain diatom. Very beautiful. Uh, but I wouldn't want to eat it. <laughs> it looks very spiky. If I were a, a, a four-day-old oyster larvae, I, th that would be bigger than your head. So you wouldn't want to eat that. Um, there are a couple different ways of culturing microalgae. Wells Glancy would be trying to get some of our local algae to grow. <coughs> Nobody uses this technique anymore. If you'd like to play around with it, you could. Uh, the Milford method will be intensely talked about in Josh's lecture, no doubt, because this, this was developed in Milford, Connecticut, uh, with a group there. That, if it wasn't for this uh, kind of uh, cutting edge research back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, we might not be where we're at with culturing shellfish. A uh, continuous culture method is really what Josh's forte is. So. We're gonna look at all of that stuff. Stock cultures of algae, you start with a known species and you're gonna bump it up. The Lassiocyro wise flogii, you can see that. And then it goes up to, to uh, uh, from stock flasks to uh, carboys and they grow and they grow and we'll talk about that. And, oh, that was a video, but it doesn't show. 
up to, uh, if you're doing Milford batch method up to what's called a cow wall tube, it's growing and growing and doubling and doubling. And now you can, and this is part of a, the uh, continuous algae culture system, uh, which we have quite an elaborate brand new one now, up to the photo bioreactor, which is really a remarkable piece of equipment that Josh and his team are becoming kind of like the, well, certainly the East Coast gurus of it. So that'll be interesting to hear the whole lowdown of, of this. This is a touch screen algae growing machine. Uh, it's not R2D2, it's not a landing craft. It's actually full of algae and it's, it's quite an interesting piece of equipment. I'm just gonna quickly mention to you that, and, and again, Josh is gonna talk about a lot of these things, but the growth phase of algae, the way it works is you start with these cells of algae and as they start to grow, they grow exponentially up a curve, doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling at a very fast rate. They keep, that's exponential growth, and up, 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 up growth until you get to, that's called log phase growth. It's going exponentially up until you get to a stationary phase where it just kind of plateaus based on uh, you know, certain requirements, either nutrients or light or maybe even space. And once it stays in stationary phase too long, it'll go into a kind of a death crash and, and, and die there. And so I'm hoping that when Josh gives his lecture about continuing algae culture, he talks about this little tip of the arrow right here, which would be the peak of, of log phase growth. Because theoretically, if you can reach the peak of log phase growth and hold it there, you can grow algae indefinitely at its highest rate. And so that's very intriguing thought, very intriguing thought. Uh, does anyone know how long algae lives for? Here's a, here's a Zen thought for you. Algae is eternal. You like that? Algae, in theory, is eternal. It just keeps cloning and cloning. And so the, the, the blue-green algae from whatever, a billion years ago, is still on our planet, the, in theory. Uh, in practice, it always dies, <laughs> you know, because, you know, in a perfect world with no impurities and it cloning and cloning and cloning, theoretically that algae cell can live forever. Uh, in our world, uh, we seem to be able to kill everything if we want to. Uh, you can count algae cells, you use a bright line hemocytometer. If anyone wants to learn how to count algae cells, uh, you can do it in the laboratory. It's a little counting grid under the microscope. You take a sample, you count it. Why would we wanna know how many algae cells we have? Well, we've got to feed our animals and they got to be fed the right ration of food. And, and so we do have to know how, how dense our algae is when we're growing it. Now, I'm just going to briefly mention something very cool about unicellular microalgae, because I've been growing it for the last 32 years or something uh, for, to feed shellfish. But it turns out that as far as a plant-like creature on our planet, microalgae is by far the fastest growing plant-like creature on the planet. And so here's a little chart. We use corn in our gasoline, ethanol, okay? And according to this chart, it takes an acre of corn will make 168 liters of biofuel source. And if you look down at microalgae, it, it, it's almost an order of magnitude greater than that for one acre. So if you were to pick what you wanted to use for, for biofuel, this one, and it might not be marine, it might be a freshwater species that's chosen. This is not something I'm making up. The military has already flown uh, planes using biofuel from microalgae. Lufthansa actually flew a commercial flight 
from biofuel from microalgae. And can you imagine being on that flight? This is your captain speaking. I just want you to know we're running off a of plant fuel and nah, I don't know, it's not plant. So I guess it's safe. As he said, we have a protist fuel supply. And then you might feel more secure. I don't know. I never feel secure on a plane anyway, so it doesn't matter. But this is something that I think our, our future is going to be paying a little bit closer attention to in the next, <laughs> I've been saying this for so long that maybe I just keep saying it and another 20 years will go by and we never got to it. But uh, some people are, oh, and I, Josh, if you're listening, try to include that, that Marty Burns uh, system that he just added to. Oh, yeah, this, I think, sure. was the guy that was kind of coming up with that array. And I think what Marty just got, and somebody just sent me another email about it uh, this morning, about this kind of triangular, huge 55,000 liter system uh, and Kim, when I see when I, when I see you on Monday, remind me to tell you a very funny story about that. I'm not going to tell it now, but I'll tell I'll tell I'll tell you on Monday. Remind, right. remind me. <laughs> I love I love this picture because this reminds me of something I would have done in grad school, including having the Dewalt drill in the picture here, unfinished thing. You know these. This looks very cool, but it's very hard to scale something like this up to be worthwhile, other than for research. Um, maybe not. I don't know. It's kind of an interesting rig. Um, I love this picture because of these open tanks of tetraselmas, which we've grown. Josh, when he first came on board, we were growing open tanks of this stuff, and we couldn't get, we couldn't kill it. It was, it was really a, a, a phenomenal uh, tank full of really good algae. So there's, there's all kinds of fooling around with, uh, but I'll tell you, this is what I oh, and so. You know, here's a, a biodiesel RV traveling around the U U.S. on, on uh, biofuel made from these sources. This is where I want to be. This is what, Kona, Hawaii. Uh, I'm going to go join Paul Pomerantz <laughs> and, uh, in, in Hawaii. And, and this is going to be our backyard of all these really cool looking. Uh, I mean, come on. Tell me that this isn't psychedelic. Uh, what are they doing in Hawaii? I don't know. It's very cool. So, you know, typical commercial microalgae. This is typical? Okay. You know, we've got to go and do a field trip to go check out this typical algae culture in Hawaii. For the purpose of, and I love this picture because I, I'd show this picture to high school students and say, well, this is the pathway of, of what we're talking about here. And they look at me and say, well, what does any of it mean? And what it means is every arrow is a job. So you might only be doing this part of the cycle. You'd be sitting at your little machine doing this arrow right here. You're going from Calvin and Hobbes to starch. And uh, well, I miss you know, it. Almost six. Yeah, so it looks complicated, but it's, it, it's also simple. This is the goal. You want to have your little lotus uh, filled with algae power, so you can tool around the planet uh, and and not you know not pollute. So we'll see if that happens. Uh, maybe Josh will talk about algae backups, but I would just say that you know if you if you can't learn how to grow microalgae, you pretty much can't run a shellfish hatchery. We've tried. We've tried to use this uh, algae concentrate and uh, it doesn't really work that well. Or you could just sit in your backyard and, and you know, live a peaceful life and fill up your little basket and, and you know, make pudding and things like that. That's what I want to do. I want to be that person right there. I'm going to concentrate on being that person in my backyard by the water doing that. And I think that's it. That's, yeah, that's it. So let me, uh, let me go back to this. And how do we do? Everyone was happy with that? I hope you were happy. And uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna do these, uh, we're gonna do these little lectures throughout the year. 
And if you're interested in any kind of topic that you'd want to dive into, you know, the thing with Zoom is it, it, it's not very personal. I didn't, I didn't ever want to do it because it wasn't my shtick. I like being with people. But I got to say, it's pretty convenient being at the house and, and seeing everybody and, and giving them the information. So I'm willing to do as many of these as you want to do. You know, we can, oh, well, not every day. Uh, come on. But there is a lot of information out there. Uh, there certainly is a lot of uh, information online. You can study it. You can do anything you want. But I highly recommend anytime you hear any of these topics, if you want to do them hands on, you have the opportunity to do that at the Marine Center. Uh, the, a question came up right at the beginning, a new SPAT member. I never knew I had to grow algae. Well, you don't. You don't have to grow algae to, to, to grow your oysters. You know, that's, that's really not what, what it's all about. What it's all about is if you want to, it's like if you were, if, if you were in a uh, cocktail recipes with algae, hmm, I'll have to look that up. We can get into the color. If you want to get more into the culinary aspects of all of this stuff, I mean, I'm a, I, I, I've, I've just recorded a, sh a oyster shucking video that'll come out next week. If you want to get into some cooking things, we can do that. I'm not really that well versed with algae, but I'm certainly willing to learn. Um, so we can do that. But, you know, again, any of these things that you uh, see that you want to try out, that's what we do at the Marine Center. I mean, we're, we're raising algae. We're going to be spawning oysters. We're going to be raising larvae. We're going to be setting the seed. We're going to be raising the seed in all the systems. We're going to be doling out the seed to your gardens. And that's what we do. So uh, the, you, it's not required. You don't have to do any of it, but you're certainly welcome to. And there's no hard sell on it and there's no minimum or maximum. It's the weirdest program I've ever heard of uh, that you know, in a way you could get a graduate level degree in this stuff, or you could just pick up your oysters and, and hang out at your dock and, you know, and that's enough. So I leave it up to everybody. Hey, Tom, uh, I leave it up to everybody how they want to do it. Uh, we are in business. Uh, it's helpful if you send me the emails like you've been doing to let me know you're coming just so we don't have, you know, 100 people all come at the same time. But if, if we do, we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll just put you each in your own little cow wall tube as a kind of a sterilizing uh, system. And, and then, you know, we'll talk through the through the plastic and the face mask and stuff. I think we're going to get through this quick, you know, by the end of the summer, I think we're going to be in better shape um, with this whole COVID thing. Uh, I think everyone's done really well in our group, um, except for Josh. He got, <laughs> Josh, he didn't mean to. There he is. He, Josh, hey. Josh didn't mean to get COVID, but he did. You got a dose of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it wasn't fun it was yeah. not fun so at all. he's the only one I know that actually got it so uh but he's fine and uh young and strapping and he didn't infect anybody and so you know yeah. we, we all we all band together and and we're gonna have a good through all of this crazy stuff we're still gonna have a good year so i thank everyone for coming out uh everyone's got my email and uh stay in touch and don't be shy good you. Kim, Thanks. what are the fat days again? What's that? What are the volunteer days again? Uh, you know, we've been doing Monday, Wednesday, Fridays from eight to noon for the last 21 years. So I think that's a good <laughs> schedule. I like that schedule. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to do that. If you, if, if those aren't good days and you want to go do some other things, certainly as the weather gets better, just let me know. And I am moving back to Southold. Boy, I tell you, when I move oh. back to Southold, um, that, that's going to make it easier for me because uh, I got a two wow, and a you half are? hour commute otherwise. What? You what are? Time? Yeah, I, we're I'm... in contract on a house in Southold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're going to move there and hopefully in June because they 
they have an autistic son that wants to finish school. So we're letting him finish school. And there's Kimmy. Hi guys. So, Hi. Yeah, so, right, so we're gonna be- I'm looking uh, forward to it. Yeah, we're across the street from the blueberry farm. So it's gonna be exciting. Oh, nice. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not on the water, but I don't need the water. I got the water at work. So I'll, I just water. have to keep working for the next 20 years. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad you all came out and now you can go to have dinner. Oh, and we recorded this. So uh, we'll, we'll have this for people to share or whatever they want to do and we'll see how it goes. Okie dokie. Have a great weekend. Don't get snowed in if you're going to Big Sur or anything like that. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Kim. Have a great okay. day. Okay, we'll talk to you later. How do we end it? <laughs> How do we end it? Stop. End. Leave. Leave. You look great, Kim. Hey, good to see everybody. <laughs> Wait, that's an auto. Oh, look at that big smile. Oh, there she is. Oh, I heard There's it. The I heard it. Okay. Hi, Darcy. Wow, look at that. Hey. Oh, she's, on, she's, on the, she's on the bridge. <laughs> so cool. Are you having fun with that? Oh, I have a bridge? Oh, get out of here. What? How did I do that? I don't even know how I did that. You didn't see you that? You look good, Kimmy.